What would you buy if you had $100 million? Palazzo in Venice, maybe, or perhaps a, a fleet of private jets or a personal submarine? Or would you plough it all into a single painting? Some of the richest people in the world have done just that. I think you're better at $95 million. What makes the super rich splash out so much money on art? Is it love, rivalry, or just big business? I want to find out more about this infamously secretive art world and the multi-millionaires who populate it. You've got your grubby hands on my beautiful wall. I, I do apologise. I'm searching for the most expensive paintings in the world to uncover the stories behind their record-breaking prices. Fair warning. Going. This is Christie's big showroom in London, and what you can see are the paintings, some of the paintings that will be sold at the big evening auction in New York, which is coming up in just a few weeks. And this is one of the highlights. It's a Picasso. It's a series that he did in the 50s, known as the Women of Algiers, and it's got an upper estimate of $30 million. This is another of the star lots. This is a Monet from a series he did, I think, in the 1890s, 1891. These are poplar trees. This could sell for as much as $30 million. And this is a Rothko that's been practically unknown to art historians, belonged in a private collection. Let's have a look at the estimate. This could sell for $22 million, apparently. $22 million. $30 million. That sounds like an awful lot of money for a painting. Well, it's not. It's a bargain compared to the eye-watering amounts paid for the top ten paintings sold at auction. When you think about it, art is a little bit like magic because just with the wave of a brush, something that has no practical purpose whatsoever, just a worthless scrap of canvas covered with inexpensive pigment, can become this priceless object that's desired by many of the wealthiest and most powerful people anywhere on the planet, abracadabra. But how exactly is it done? Just what is the link between art and money? My story starts here in New York, where the American abstract painter Mark Rothko dominated the art world in the 50s and 60s. And it's perhaps a surprise to those who find abstract art hard to take that one of his paintings is number 10 on my list. To find out why, I've come to a billionaire's skyscraper. This is Rothko's white center and it would cost you more than 72 million dollars 72 million eight hundred and forty thousand to be precise and that put it at number 10 in our list of the most expensive paintings in the world going up So I'm looking at 33, 34, 35 million dollars, under 36 million The painting was sold at the auctioneer's Sotheby's in New York in 2007. 63 million dollars, fair warning, selling in there 64 million just in time. And when you factor in the hefty buyer's premium on top of the hammer price stated by the auctioneer, Thank you. this made it a record-breaking amount, more than three times the previous price paid for a Rothko. So what does this tell us? That White Center is officially the 10th best painting ever made? Not exactly. The important thing to remember is that value isn't only linked to quality. Something that can send the price of a painting rocketing is what's known in the art world as provenance, who has owned the painting in the past. And in the case of Rothko's White Center, it was owned by one of the wealthiest and most powerful dynasties in America, the Rockefellers, who amassed their fortune from oil and banking and reshaped the New York skyline with the Rockefeller Center. On the 56th floor, David Rockefeller built an impressive art collection that included works by Picasso, Gauguin and Mark Rothko. In 1960, he paid less than $10,000 for White Center. Half a century later, it was worth more than $72 million. Today, the painting is even known informally as the Rockefeller Rothko, which says it all. The name of its former owner is as important as that of the artist. To find out whether White Center deserves its number 10 slot, I'm on my way to New York's famous Pace Gallery to meet one of the world's leading art dealers, Arnie Glimcher. 
Arnie was friends with Rothko and has been buying and selling his work for 50 years. Is this a really great Rothko? It is a wonderful painting. It is a wonderful painting. Um, but what Rothko is really interested in is the idea of an almost formlessness use of color to transmit pure human emotion. I mean, you just have to strip away all of the prejudices that you have looking at a painting by Rothko and let it flow over you like great music flows over you. You know, there are very few artists in the history of art that create something that we have never seen before. And Rothko is one of those artists. But all kinds of things converge for a painting to bring that sum of money. And, um, such as what? Such as its provenance. It was the Rockefeller name, which, you know, amazed, amazed me. Um, Why do you say it amazed you? Because the whole thing of art and money is ridiculous. The value of a painting at auction is not necessarily the value of a painting. It's the value of two people bidding against each other because they really want the painting. And the people who bid the most for White Center are rumored to be oil billionaires, just like the Rockefellers, the Qatari royal family, who will be hosting the Football World Cup in 2022. Sadly, though, White Center hasn't been seen since the auction. I can't even show you a good reproduction. But my next painting couldn't be any more different. Here, the buyer specifically wanted to show a lost masterpiece to the world. At number nine in our list is Peter Paul Rubens' Massacre of the Innocents, which sold at auction in 2002 for $76,529,058. The Flemish painter Peter Paul Rubens is considered one of the greatest artists of all time, so perhaps it's unsurprising that an old master makes it onto my list. Actually, it's rare for such a good quality painting to come to auction. Nearly all the finest old masters are now in museums, and they're highly unlikely to ever reach the market again. It's hard not to feel a little bit upset when you encounter this picture, because there's just no shying away from the subject matter. It tells the story of King Herod's massacre of the newborn boys of Bethlehem. And it's terrifying. You see muscly soldiers ripping babies from their mother's arms and dashing them to the floor. The women themselves are weeping and wailing and scratching, clawing at the faces of their assailants and these lifeless corpses of the infants. Here, down at the bottom of the, the painting, tossed aside like unwanted, forgotten dolls, and they have this distressing shade to their skin, this stone-cold blue. It's just too painful almost to look at, and full of anguish and grief and despair and high-wrought, full-blooded emotion. To be able to do that, to transform something so horrendous and so complex into a coherent piece of beauty is just astounding. And I wondered before coming here whether it's worth paying $76.5 million for any picture at all, but you come here and you see this painting and it is a total, total knockout. The Massacre of the Innocents is even more astonishing when you consider that until recently, it wasn't even thought to have been a Rubens at all. When it was finally identified or attributed to Rubens, the painting's value increased exponentially overnight, adding several noughts to its price. Here at the National Gallery, art historian David Jaffe helped reveal who really painted The Massacre of the Innocents by comparing it with another Rubens masterpiece, Samson and Delilah. Do you remember when you first saw it? Yeah, I saw it uh, at Sotheby's, up in their upper sort of so-called private room. It was pretty extraordinary, you know, it was one of those ones where I said, well, we don't have to have a large discussion on this, it's clearly right. Tell me about the comparisons between Samson and Delilah 
and the Massacre of the Innocents. We actually took them upstairs here where we've got decent sunlight and you can look at them very carefully and they had a lot of the same nuances. Just as you cross a T in a certain way and dot an I in a certain way, paint his hand over brush. Particularly when they're bored, Rubens often does a little zigzag. I mean, you see it on the ankle of this painting. You're looking for his handwriting in paint. Um, and if the handwriting works, it's by that artist. But once the Massacre of the Innocents was attributed to Rubens, what does that do to the value of the painting? Well, I think everyone wants to buy, you know, the real thing. There are very few great Rubenses of any period in his career now you can buy. So when a great one comes up, it gets an exponential thrust, I guess, until it's on that moment of being actually for sale, it doesn't have any value. I mean, it's an absolutely arbitrary thing, you know, and you can't predict how idiotic three or four people will be to try and chase the magic rabbit around the circuit when it comes up. Only billionaires can chase that rabbit. Ken Thompson was Canada's richest man. He built a global media empire that once encompassed the Times and the Sunday Times. He pumped millions into the Art Gallery of Ontario in his hometown of Toronto to share the glory of art and its creation, as he put it, with the world. The Thompsons are intensely private and seldom give interviews, but Ken's son, David, who bid for the Massacre of the Innocents with his father, has agreed to speak to me. My father began collecting in the 50s. He'd mutter, and sometimes he'd, he'd, he'd hit me in the arm and say, Paul, oh, look at this. Can you imagine someone being able to carve this way? I mean, look at David. Oh, look at the spine. I mean, this is how he, he responded. And with each object, it would be a different facet to the object. It would be the patination, it would be the color. One of the defining moments in the history of the collection, of course, came when you bought Rubens' Massacre of the Innocents and paid what still is a world record for an old master painting of just north of $76.5 million. Weekly, um, until the auction, he'd come down with the catalogue and he'd ask me, David, what do you think this will fetch? What would you do if you were me? And I'd say, Dad, I, I think, frankly, you need to buy this picture. It's something that resonates like nothing else. You must have had to fend off some supremely stiff competition you must have known there was going to be a fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was your strategy? To triumph. <laughs> to don't last them. You knew you were going to win. We knew we were going to win. At least I had a feeling we were going to win. 45 million pounds. Gonna sell last chance at. The final price was 49 million 500 thousand pounds, or 76 and a half million dollars. After it was over, there was silence. He took his glasses off. And he took a few deep breaths, and I think he said something to the effect, oh my goodness, it's an enormous sum of money. And on a painting, you think to yourself, you know, it's shopping centers, it's, it's, it's tangible, but it was a marker for my father and for his collections. Ken Thompson died before he could see the Massacre of the Innocents hang as the centerpiece of his collection at the Art Gallery of Ontario on display for everyone to see forever. How do you feel when you go to the art gallery now? Look at this painting. I imagine if it were me, I'd want to, every time I saw it, just kind of punch the air that I'd got this thing with my dad and given it now to the world. How do you feel? I feel... I just feel a wellspring of emotion because it symbolized a journey for my father it symbolized a journey between father and son. And it resonated for us as it resonates for so many others. It's a very uh, remarkable touchstone. So what have I learned from painting number nine? Well, that overnight, the same painting can be viewed in a completely different way. One day, the massacre of the innocents was overlooked. The next, it was suddenly the most expensive old master ever sold. The canvas was exactly the same, but the way it was perceived was magically transformed by its attribution to a superstar artist. 
To get more of an insight into the mentality of the art collector, I've come to a luxury penthouse apartment overlooking the Thames, owned by one of the world's best-selling novelists. What shall I call you? Jeffrey? Jeffrey. Lord Jeffrey. Jeffrey? Jeffrey. That's very kind. Thanks. This is Sisley. Sisley. I love that picture. Is that a pastel? It's a pastel which is very rare. He painted just over a hundred pastels in his lifetime. And it's one of those rare paintings where I wanted it within seconds of seeing it. Sometimes I debate, think, go back, look a second time. That one I knew immediately. You've got your grubby hands on my beautiful wall. I, I do apologize. Geoffrey Archer is currently 583rd in Britain's rich list. He's had a colorful career. A politician and confidant of Margaret Thatcher, he was made a lord by John Major, but he's also served a prison sentence for perjury. But it's his novels that have allowed him to pursue his passion for collecting art. Not old masters, but 19th century impressionists. Now here you will see one of my philosophies on collecting. Because I can't afford the major impressionists, I buy uh, the next rank down. And they're often just as good, but not as well known. And this is a, a camoir. Well, now, this looks if, like Matisse. Well, or Gauguin. If that was a Gauguin and this was a Van Gogh, you're talking not ten times the price. You're talking a hundred times the price. I suppose... Uh, let's get rid of your coat. Oh, sorry. thanks. Um, I suppose the big thing about the main room is... The view. Exactly. Which you prefer, your paintings or the view? Oh, no, it's amazing, because when people come here, they immediately say the view. It is hard not just to stand here like this, um, yes, which is which a is shame what, for the collection. Frankly, what most sense. people do. They walk in, they see the view, they forget the pictures completely. I can't help noticing... Uh, you, you talked about having second-rank artists in the corridor in terms of the impressionists, but here is Andy Warhol. Well, is he first-rate? I don't think so. Do you I not? think he's very expensive now, but I don't think he's a great artist. No, I don't. I do like this. It's not dissimilar, the hairstyle <laughs> between Marilyn and Margaret Thatcher beneath. Yes, they were both powerful women. <laughs> so uh, how much do you think this would be worth now? I have no idea. Don't be so vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> you called me the vulgarian. Vulgar question. Does the money for buying art come from... This is a golden book. This is the equivalent of going platinum, Cain and Abel. Mm. Yes, that's the breakthrough. If that's what you're getting at in your continued vulgar way. Yes, it was Cain and Abel that made it possible for me to have the collection I have. My favourite picture, in a way, is this one, the Albert Goodwin, often compared as an artist to Turner. And what you see there, of course, is he must have painted it from just over there. And it's the amazing golds and the amazing colours. At night, when the sun is coming over it, it looks magnificent. When did you buy it? Oh, 30 years ago. So you've been collecting for several decades? I've been collecting for 50 years. Let's face it, if you get into this mad world, it's like drugs. <laughs> you don't... You have to have another one. You have to have another fix. I mean, it's just awful. And you, wherever you see something you can just about afford, you just about afford it. Your country collectors are all stupid and mad. And collectors really go mad for the artist at number seven in our top ten. And I'll explain why we've jumped to seven in a moment. No one quite captures the imagination like Claude Monet, the prince of the Impressionists. He spent the second half of his life depicting his gardens at Giverny, especially the water lilies, which he painted obsessively. Most of them are in museums, so when a good one comes on the market, it creates a frenzy. At number seven in my top ten, it's Monet's water lily pond, going for $80,379,591. And I'm with Tanya Poss, who bid for the painting and won. Well, Tanya, tell me about the night that you bid $80 million for this painting. Well, where to start? I knew that this painting was going to outshine its, its estimate, and there was a lot of competition in the room. I knew that it was a very important piece for Monet because uh, of his water lily series that he painted consecutively for 26 years. Although that, that's the question I wanted to ask yeah. because there's so many of these paintings. What's special about this one that well, means it's worth so much? First of all, of his late water lilies, few are signed. And this is a completed late version. 
signed by the artist. We should make clear that you weren't buying this for yourself, you were buying this for somebody else. Yes. Who were you buying it for? I will never say. <laughs> God, it's tantalising stuff. Confidentiality is part of my job. What is it that motivates some of these collectors to spend this amount on works of art? Well, I think um, the people I work with are surrounded by quality in their lives, so why would it stop in their art collecting? They, they wish to have the very best, and they want to be surrounded by the very best, whether it's their home, their car, their planes. I mean, it's, it's just the way they live their lives. Take a good look at the painting. It's appeared only once in public in the last 80 years, and since the auction, hasn't been seen again. And this brings me to the story of the shocking disappearance of the next two paintings in our top ten. The most popular postcard sold by the National Gallery is this one. It's a reproduction of a still life of a vase of sunflowers painted by Vincent van Gogh in 1888. You can see that, in reality, it's much more luminous and radiant. This is one of the most famous paintings in the world, and if it ever came onto the market, it would sell for an insane amount of money. But it won't. But when the highest achievements by some of our greatest artists do appear at auction, then the art market can be influenced by much more than simply love of the painting. That's exactly what happened in the heady days just before the stock market crash of 1990, when two paintings sold within days of each other, Vincent van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gachet at Christie's and Au Moulin de la Galette by Pierre-Auguste Renoir at Sotheby's. Number eight and number six in my top ten, purchased in a mad two-day spending spree by the same collector. In the late 80s, buying art had become a muscular, masculine pursuit. Buying the best was like big game hunting, only to be attempted by the bravest with the deepest pockets. It was a rampaging bull market, and prices were being forced up by the new kids on the art block. The Japanese. Hold on, everyone else. 71 million dollars, congratulations. The man with the biggest wallet in the room was a paper tycoon, Ryoe Saito. Intensely eccentric and secretive, no one knew whether he'd bought both paintings for love or solely as an investment because he spirited them away, out of sight even from his own family. The man who sold Portrait of Dr. Gachet is legendary auctioneer Christopher Burge. 17 million. He sold more of the paintings in this film than anyone else. I want to discover more about the role and power of auctioneers and how they steer prices skyward in all the excitement of the auction room. This is the Woods Room, which is the second of our um, sale rooms here, the smaller of the two, where we conduct most of our auctions. I would say 90% of all our auctions take place in here. And this, of course, is the room in which we are about to give you an auction lesson. This is where I'm going to learn the, the trade. This is where you're going to learn the trade. My, a, a large staff will be assembling fairly soon to act as bidders, telephone bidders, sales clerks, and the rest of it, just as if it were an auction. I thought it was just going to be you and me. No, 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 no. Let's begin with lot 327, a sculpture by Rodan. Do I have any bids at 24,000 in the room? Do I have 28? Thank you, madam. $28,000. $30,000. Thank you even more. I tend for months before these big sales to, to have anxiety dreams about the auctions. Do you still get nervous? Oh, God, terrified. Um, more so, actually, the, the, the more I do it, the more nervous I get. Do I have $150,000 in the room? Someone? Anyone in the room? Anyone at all? I'm not getting much love from the room. Art dealers, collectors, hangers-on, most of them, frankly, would love to see something go wrong. It's quite gladiatorial, <laughs> the whole thing. You get the feeling that the thumbs are sort of like this and will very quickly do go like that if the auctioneer makes a hideous mistake. Would you like to pay $55,000? It's against you, sir, $55,000. I know your habits. I can sometimes get an extra bid. $55,000? <laughs> 
Once you get into the swing of the auction, it's easy to lose sight of the numbers and the reality of the sums at stake. Sold to this madam, uh, this lady over here, <laughs> $58,000. But as Burge concedes, occasionally prices in the auction room are not just about the paintings. Doesn't it happen in auctions that sometimes prices go so high that people afterwards applaud? Only once was there ever sustained applause for a lot that I sold, and that was for the uh, Van Gogh portrait of Dr. Gachet. When it was sold, uh, and, and I hammered it down at $82.5 million, which was then the world record price for, for any work of art, there was you know, sustained applause. People leapt to their feet, they cheered and yelled. And this applause went on for several minutes, which is completely unheard of in, in an auction. The reason everybody applauded, I, I believe, is because we had a very serious financial situation developing in 1990. All sorts of things were collapsing, and the Japanese buyers, who'd been the mainstay of the market, were beginning to get nervous and were pulling out, and everybody was convinced that the market was going to tumble. And that lot, for a moment, stayed the collapse, as it were. And I think what everybody was applauding, they were applauding out of relief that they had saved their money. And you know, my feeling was one of, I have to admit it, really great distaste. It was extremely uncomfortable. I almost felt like just walking off while this applause was going on and just going off stage and not returning. They weren't applauding for Van Gogh. They weren't applauding for the work of art. They were applauding for money. Whatever Saito's motives were for buying the Van Gogh and the Renoir, he faced financial ruin soon afterwards. Extraordinarily, he threatened to burn the paintings rather than sell them. In 1996, he died, and the paintings haven't been seen since. Some genuinely believe he carried out his threat to reduce them to ashes. Others think they were secretly sold to pay his debts. Either way, they've passed into art world mythology. Just imagine the prices they'd achieve if they ever appeared again. Number five in our top ten is by a painter known for his brutal, difficult work. And it brings me to London's Chelsea, where millionaires live behind metal gates and brick walls. So many millionaires, in fact, that it's easy to get the wrong house. Here, there they are, Francis Bacon, that's right. These are not genuine, sadly. Oh. They're Mr Jagger, are they? Um, Mr. Abramovich owns them. Well, would you believe it? We've got the wrong house. I'm going to have to take them. Can you show me? Yeah. Well, that's where the garden is, there. This one. So I should be putting these copies along here. Yeah. Yeah. A triptych is a series of three paintings. That's two. I have a third. This one is by a famous British artist called Francis Bacon that sold at auction in 2008 for $86,281,000, which puts it at number five in our list of the most expensive paintings in the world. And there's a reason why I'm propping them up against a wall in Chelsea in the middle of London. Behind me is a house that belongs to the Russian billionaire and owner of Chelsea FC, Roman Abramovich. And the rumours are that he bought the real triptych back in 2008. I have a very strong hunch that the real triptych is actually hanging in that house behind me. At number five, Francis Bacon's triptych, which sold at Sotheby's in New York in 2008. Bacon's paintings are rising fast. Another work went for three times its estimate earlier this year, but they're not easy to look at. Bacon was a hard drinker and heavy gambler who painted a series of grisly triptychs, and this is one of the goriest and best. Just look at those horrific winged creatures pecking at a mangled carcass. You'd have to be made of stern stuff to enjoy staring at this above your mantelpiece. Maybe Roman Abramovich bought the triptych to impress his girlfriend, Dasha Zukova, who recently opened an art gallery in Moscow. His purchases have not gone unnoticed. He also paid a record-breaking price for another artist, Lucian Freud, who's now officially Britain's most expensive living artist, thanks to Abramovich. Roman Abramovich is notoriously shy and declined my request to have a look at his mantelpiece and stare at his bacon. I have tracked down the daughter of another oligarch, though, Maria Bybikova, 
herself a collector, to find out why Abramovich and the oligarchs are descending on the art market. During communism, we actually couldn't go out and buy a painting. We couldn't aggregate funds. We didn't have bank accounts. So all of a sudden, in the 90s, we have capitalism coming in. We are able to own private property. And after the, the affluent Russians you know, buy their first homes, let's say, in their first cars, then they move on to, let's say, the luxury sector and art collecting. Obviously, the most famous oligarch within Britain is Roman Abramovich. Is he exceptional in terms of what he buys? We are only aware publicly of two works of art that Roman Abramovich has purchased. Which are? Uh, which are the Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon triptych. Uh, and I, but at the same time, he's a very substantial collector. And it's not necessarily true that everything that he's buying is at that price tag. Those were exceptional prices, weren't they? Those were exceptional prices. I guess the big question is, um, you know, did he overpay? Because it's such a large sum. I think uh, the question is, why does it matter? I'd love to get a sense from you of why uh, some of this new breed, if you like, of very wealthy Russians are buying art. Is it because they love it? Is it because they like to show off? Is it because art is a status symbol? If you really think about it, most Russian art collectors are actually very private. You actually don't really know who they are. You don't really know what they own. So, Do you know who they are and what they own? Well, a lot of them are my friends. <laughs> so, yes, but uh, they're extremely private. So, therefore, the whole idea of buying art as a status symbol falls apart right there because if, presumably if you're buying art for status, you would want people to know that you bought this or that. OK, oligarchs may not do it for global recognition, but it could be for approval among their peers. And Maria Bybakova would seem to be proof of that. So far, the collectors of my top ten paintings have bought art for love, for prestige, for investment, and as the ultimate luxury item. But the painting at number four has meaning for its buyer that goes beyond its monetary or even artistic value. Adele Blockbauer II, painted by the Viennese artist Gustav Klimt in 1912, came onto the market in spectacular fashion in 2006. The Blockbauers were wealthy Austrian Jews who, along with so many others, had their possessions stolen by the Nazis. Portrait of Adele Blockbauer II. $25 million starts it at $25 million. Now. $28 million. $29. After years of legal wrangling, the painting was restored to its rightful owner, a descendant of the family living in California, who then decided to sell it. This is known as restitution art. Guy, you're better at $78 million. With the buyer's premium, this made Adele Blockbauer II the fourth most expensive painting in the world. Ronald S. Lauder, who's himself Jewish and inherited the Estee Lauder cosmetics empire, is rumoured to have bought the painting, but he's being coy about its whereabouts. However, he has allowed me into his gallery on New York's exclusive Fifth Avenue to see another of his paintings, which is on public view, and I've heard that this one cost him even more money. Here, at the Neue Gallery in New York, there's another similar work. It's by the same artist, Klimt, he painted it five years earlier, and it's a portrait of the same model, a woman called Adele Blockbauer, who was the wife of a very wealthy sugar merchant in Vienna. The painting today is one of the most famous pictures in the world, and it's somewhere up here. I've seen this a lot in reproduction. I've never seen it for real until today. And you can't help but be amazed by this gilded, bejeweled surface. This is a very lush, sensuous work. It's so civilised. And of course, it isn't just lush and refined. It is partly made of precious metals. It's got silver and gold there going on in the canvas as well as paint, so that the whole image screams money. I think that's the thing that I find quite difficult about this painting in particular. I just can't get past this idea that ultimately it's a portrait about infatuation. Not just infatuation with a beautiful woman, infatuation with high society. The owner of this painting, the heir to a cosmetics fortune, paid 
the notorious price, reportedly, of $135 million for this painting alone in a private transaction, which, however you spin it, is a staggering sum. He calls it our Mona Lisa, I think referring to the gallery. He could be referring more widely to the fact that here it is, presented as a triumph of sorts over the atrocities that were perpetrated by the Nazis. As beautiful as it is, I think part of the reason he paid so much is because the history of this painting is bound up with a much bigger story, the history of the Jewish people during the 20th century. It's not in the top 10, only because the amount Lauder paid cannot be verified. Much of the art sold never makes it to public auction. The money changing hands remains secret. But if $135 million is correct, does this make Klimt one of the greatest artists in the world, on a par with Rubens, Monet and Van Gogh? Well, I don't think so, but perhaps for Ronald Lauder, his purchases represent a form of cultural justice, and for him, justice comes at any price. I've come to Venice because I've managed to secure an interview with our next billionaire, who just happens to be one of the most important men in the world of contemporary art right now. And unlike many collectors, he's more than happy to put his collection on public display. Francois Pinault is one of France's richest businessmen. His luxury brands include Chateau Latour, one of the world's finest wines, the Vale Ski Resort in America, and Christie's, the auctioneer. So if you've been wondering where all those buyers' premiums went, perhaps here is the answer. I'm heading towards the Punta della Dagana, which is one of two museums that Pino has here in Venice. And I really want to find out what motivates Pino to collect art at all. Does he do it for love, or is it just another business opportunity? Pino is amassing a blue-chip collection of contemporary art. This is Jeff Koons's Hanging Heart. I don't know what Pino paid for it, but another almost identical work sold for $23 million in 2007. What is the secret of building a great collection? To be passionate and to try to discover, to be very curious, to be passionate. It's a art and passion, I think. To be a great collector, do you need to take risks? Absolutely, yes. I don't know if in 50 years the artist will be... It's not the, it's not the issue. To... It's not the issue? You buy, you take your own risk after that. It's for history to tell? Yeah, absolutely. Now, the piece in here, the Maurizio Catalan horse, this... It's a good piece, like a joke, but it's not only a joke, it's a message. It's a, it goes in the wall. <laughs> There's a risk to go to, for you and for me to go in the wall, no? To go through a brick wall? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Very different. And what do you think about, I mean, the, the bad side of the market is that prices are so expensive now. You know, you spend, I don't know, $70 million for Rubens. Very sad, but what can we do? Very sad, yes, very sad. Why do you think it's sad? Because very often so it's, it's bought by, by people who don't like art really. They buy that sometimes, to, like a statue, like a social uh, appearance. And, uh, to show off, you mean? Probably sometimes. It's a pity, but what can we do? The risk of Francois Pinault frittering away his millions on art that might simply be forgotten is great but the potential reward of being remembered as an eagle-eyed patron of the Monets and Rothkos of tomorrow is even greater. Of course, Pino can afford to take such a risk. Well, 32 is next. Women of Algiers, Les Femmes d'Alger. But if you want a surefire, armour-plated investment that will impress the hell out of your friends, hang splendidly on your wall, either in your luxury penthouse or on your private yacht, then you need to get yourself or your advisor down to an auction and buy a Picasso. 
18 million seven. In still bid up. This one went for a paltry $19 million plus the buyer's premium, but the third most expensive painting in the world sold for nearly five times that. At number three, Dora Maar O'Shea. 55 with Jamie, 56 with Charlie, now 56. Sold at Sotheby's in 2006 to a mystery man in the audience who no one had ever seen before and who apparently spoke with a Russian accent. I wondered whether he was a friend of Maria Bybakova's as well. I was in the room when the, the painting was sold. Right after the auction ended, there was a, a lot of speculation about who is the buyer behind the scenes. And I think it took the art world maybe about a year to really figure that out. So who is the buyer behind the scenes? So it's a Georgian collector who prefers to remain discreet. But everyone in the art world knows who he is. Uh, I don't know about everyone, but some people in the art world knows who he, know who he is. So why don't you just tell us? If everyone knows... I'm, I, I, I'm not at liberty to. Why? What will happen? He'll kill you? No, of course not. I just uh, honour and respect uh, people's desire for privacy and discretion. The only Georgian oligarch who seems to fit the bill is this man, Boris Ivanshvili, named in the Russian edition of Forbes magazine as the likely owner of the painting. He made his money from oil and mining and lives in Moscow, presumably with Dora Maar and her cat. But this is more than I know about the owner of the next painting on my list. It's another Picasso and it was sold in 2004, but no one can tell me where it is or who the buyer might even be. Once again, when art becomes a luxury commodity in the hands of the rich, sometimes it disappears from sight. Now, this is a reproduction of the real thing. And Picasso painted Boy With A Pipe when he was 24, and he'd recently moved to Paris and had next to nothing. When Picasso put the finishing touches to Boy With A Pipe, he could never in a million years have conceived that one day his painting would be worth so much. In 2004, Boy With A Pipe was offered at auction and sold for $104 million, placing this at number two in our list. So Picasso's at number three and number two in my top ten. In fact, he occupies all three top slots. And that's because Picasso is much more than a painter. He's the ultimate luxury brand. And nowhere is this more evident than in Las Vegas. Sin City is the last place you'd come looking for fine art, you might think. But, actually, a lot of the people who built Vegas covet works of art by Pablo Picasso. And if you think about it, it's a match made in heaven, because Vegas is the most extravagant monument to money imaginable. And Picasso, well, he's famous for being the most expensive artist in the world. In fact, the billionaire property developer who built this place, the luxury Bellagio Hotel and Casino, also amassed an equally extraordinary collection of Picassos. And his name's Steve Wynn. Walk through the heart of the casino, and in among the slot machines and gaming tables, you'll find an art gallery and a Picasso fine dining experience. Most of the Bellagio's Picassos are here in the restaurant, which Steve Wynn designed, along with Picasso's own son, Claude, who did the carpet. There genuinely are Picassos everywhere. There's a huge one over there. There's one here from 1917. This is from 1971. And every detail is linked, of course, to Picasso, even the plates, which are closely modelled on his own designs for his ceramics. Bon appétit. Thank you. It is a little bit ironic that these two still lifes of flowers and fruit hanging behind me are here at all because Picasso painted them during the war when he was living in Nazi-occupied Paris and food was impossibly scarce and now they're backdrops for lavish banquets but I don't think the Bellagio really cares whether or not you study the Picassos in here. You're just supposed to bathe in the aura of exclusivity that they project. I guess it makes a kind of sense for 
one of the smartest restaurants in a city obsessed with money to have paintings worth tens of millions of dollars on the walls. But it's hard not to wonder what has become of art when it's nothing more than decoration for the fabulously wealthy, like overblown wallpaper. I'm Steve Wynn, and this is my new hotel, the only one I've ever signed my name to. Steve Wynn paid for his new hotel by selling the Bellagio, along with all those Picassos. But he did hold on to one, his favorite, Picasso's Le Rêve, which not only inspired the new hotel, but nearly became the most expensive painting in the world. Wynne suffers from a degenerative eye condition and he's slowly losing his sight. In 2006, he agreed to sell the Rev, which means the dream, for $139 million. But before the deal was done, he put his elbow through the canvas and suddenly the deal was off. We stood there in, in shock. I can't believe I've done it. Oh, no. Oh, no. And then I said, thank God it was me and not someone else. It's easy to find his hotel, obviously, but the man and the painting are far harder to track down. Now, I was hoping that Mr. Wynn would invite us into his house and I could see the dream hanging on his wall, but his people refused the interview. So instead, I've come here, just outside Vegas, and I brought along this color reproduction of the dream. And you can see that it's an erotic fantasy, really. It's a picture of Picasso's mistress, Marie Therese Walter, and her head is nodding off to one side as she's dropping into the unconscious and starting to dream. You can see her full face and also a profile. And if you see just the profile of her face there, you're left with this other quite suggestive shape, which I think is Picasso's way of saying that she has sex on the brain. The Dream is one of Picasso's finest paintings, but Steve Wynn may have bought it in part because of its previous owner. We're back to provenance. Except this time, it's not a billionaire collector, but a middle-class New York family who amassed an extraordinary collection of Picassos. What is considered the most important 20th century art collection ever offered at auction shattered a record at Christie's in New York City last night. The collection of Victor and Sally Gantz raked in more than $206 million, and that sets a record for a single owner auction. 57 items sold. The collector's children put the masterpieces up for sale after Sally Gantz died earlier this year. This is a book that Christie's produced just before the sale. And what they were trying to convey was something about my parents and the way they collected art. So the way this book works is it goes through all the artists they collected one by one. And so if you look at Picasso, you'll just see, you know. Well, there's the dream. There's the dream. But, but all of these pictures were they owned, them. yes. Uh, here's this. This one I, is I this was, one. Yes, this one is this one. This is one of the... This uh, is Winter Landscape, 1950. Yeah, 1950. There They're they are. my parents when they were getting married. They were married in 1941. And in 1942, which was two years before I was born, they bought the dream. That was a very, very, very bold, brave and big purchase for them. Do you know how much it cost them? It cost $7,000. And to put that in context, was that... To put it in context, the rent on the apartment that they had was $300 a month. So it cost more than two years' rent. Right. That's more an investment. Less. It sounds like, the way you're talking, that the dream was one of the early purchases then. Is it that... was the first thing they bought. That was the first mm -hmm. work of art mm -hmm. they bought, was the dream by Picasso. Mm -hmm. He saw the painting. He fell in he love. He fell totally in love with it, the way you fall in love with a person. Couldn't get it out of his mind and figured they had to scrape together the money and give up other things in order to buy it. What did your mum and dad do? How did they afford to be able to buy the art that they bought? My father was in the costume jewelry business, which he had inherited, and my mother didn't work, as, as women didn't work in, in those days. And they didn't have very much money. They didn't really have savings. They had a rent-controlled apartment. And my father fell in love with Picasso. It sounds like they weren't buying for investment at all. No, oh, not at all. How would you describe the, the motivations, if you like, uh, that drove them to buy these works? Love. How 
did you feel when it came to the sales? Very sad. First of all, right after my mother died, she died the second. We were inundated with people you can imagine. I mean, teams of people from Sotheby's and Christie's and literally people from England and from Japan and people from all over sort of descending on the house. And that was a fairly uncomfortable um, situation. That's shameless, though. Well, that's what they do. That's their job. D does this happen all the time? Is this oh, how it of works? Of course. Of course. Believe me, they have, now it's all computerized, but they have on their computer, you know, the 50 most important collectors in the world and where their works of art are and where they live and how old they are and when they're about to die and who's going to inherit what, and they, they know all this. It's a death watch. They, um, as my mother used to say, the vultures are circling. Oh, the sale room is such a morbid place. It's about death and divorce. I mean, was it a necessity in the sense that there were a number of kind of things like presumably taxes, death duties and so on? There was to be paid? a number of one big fat thing called tax. In America at that time, the taxes were about 55%. So, so that means if you'd retained a painting like The Dream, mm -hmm. you would have had to pay 55 or 60% to the taxman of its value, as perceived by the auction house at the right. time. Is that right? How did you feel when you subsequently learned that The Dream ended up in the possession of Steve Wynn, who, by all accounts, is a very different man to the man that your father was. Steve Wynn, I've met him, he's a very nice man. I'm sorry that he put his elbow through the painting. That was unfortunate. But I do remember they, it was um, in an exhibition in New York a couple of years ago, and the director of the gallery said, the repair is so skillful that no one has been able to see where it is. And I went into the gallery and I went into the room and it was way down at the other end. And as I started to walk down the room, I was alone, nobody else was in there. I could see immediately where it was. Where was it out of interest? Because I've heard various things. It's, um, well, you can't see it. Here's a picture of my son standing in front of it, but it's down sort of behind, right around there. The left forearm, her left forearm. Yeah, it's, it's right about there, actually. I don't know how big the hole is, but the scar that you can see is about that big. I mean, in a sense, here's a painting that had survived intact and been looked after and loved in your family for many decades, and it's in someone else's possession, and it's suddenly damaged. Well, you know, it really, it fundamentally doesn't change the picture. Change the value of the picture? I mean, I think the picture is more important than the money, so... When you hear sums like that attached to works of art, can you justify that? I mean, how do you feel when you no, hear that? No, I think numbers? it's very sad. I mean, when you think, what else you could do with that money in this world now? I think it's ridiculous. When you say, well, how much money is it worth? Then it's not about the art anymore. Certainly the prices paid for our top ten paintings are not just about the art. They reflect provenance and attribution, buying for investment and buying to make a grand statement. Only very occasionally are they all about love. So 58 million, 59 million, and 59, 60 million, 61 million, 67 In May 2010, million, another Picasso came onto the market. 69 million, 72 million, 73 million. And this painting became the most expensive work of art ever sold at auction. I was thrilled to be involved with it. It hadn't been seen um, for 50 years. So most um, Picasso scholars today had not seen the picture, didn't know what it looked like. So it was, it was in that respect, thrilling. $95 million. It's an incredibly complex and beautiful work of art. And selling at $95 million. At number one in our top ten, it's nude green leaves and bust, with the buyer's premium taking it way past the $100 million mark to $106,482,500. So who can afford to pay such a colossal amount of money for a painting? I have heard a rumour that uh, the most expensive painting ever sold at auction, nude green leaves and bust by Picasso, was bought by a Russian. Is that something that you know about? As far as I understand, it was bought by a Georgian. But I can't say anything else. <laughs> Whoever has bought it has also done something rather rare. They've agreed to lend it to Tate Modern in London for two years. The price it achieved gives it an aura. 
Maybe when people look at it, now all they see are pound signs. But actually, it really is quite a phenomenal work. It might not be the best painting in the world, but it's strong, self-confident and sophisticated. It belongs to the same sequence of paintings as The Dream, the one that Steve Wynne poked his elbow through. And like that canvas, its subject is the artist's blonde, voluptuous mistress. Picasso was 50 when he painted this, and Marie Therese was only 22. And they'd met five years earlier when Picasso stopped Marie Therese, who was 17 at the time, in the street outside a department store in Paris and said, I am Picasso. I'd like to do a portrait of you, and I feel we're going to do great things together. And by Marie Therese's own admission, they were sleeping together within a week. And looking at this picture, you can tell that Picasso fell head over heels, because if anything, nude green leaves and bust is the most lavish picture about the rapturous dividends of a midlife crisis. This is about sexual fulfillment. It's about illicit sensual bliss. Marie Therese's flesh here, which is this radiant lilac, such a contrast to the predominantly dark blue background, is so pliant and soft and spherical, just like the fiery orange-red fruit in the bottom left-hand corner, as though she's something to be consumed, like a big puffy pink marshmallow. But there is one detail about this painting that I find ever so slightly sinister. If you look very carefully, in between the plaster bust and the plant, you can just make out a very dark, shadowy profile that's a self-portrait, as though the artist himself is part of that blue curtain, watching over his lover, guarding her, enveloping her. And Picasso supposedly said, for me, there are only two types of women, goddesses and doormats. But I think that here, Marie Therese is both. She's a resplendent fertility goddess, if you like, but at the same time, she's positioned quite submissively beneath both the artist and the viewer. And she's restrained by these two dark straps of shadow that have this slight hint of bondage. If you follow their lines, form two enormous P's, one there and one inverted here, as though the artist is branding both the image and her body with his own initials, PP, for Pablo Picasso. When the owner looks at this painting, what do you think he sees? A love letter to a woman, perhaps? Or a reflection of his own sexual prowess and extraordinary wealth? What you can say for certain is that, thankfully, here in a museum, a Picasso can be a work of art first and a luxury object second. And that can only be a good thing. But if I were you, I'd take a good long look at this painting while you can, because there's no guarantee that its anonymous owner will keep it on public view indefinitely. It seems so unfair that our access to some of the world's greatest works of art depends upon the whims of the super-rich. Sadly, we can't enjoy some of the most precious paintings in the world because so many of them are hidden away in private vaults by the millionaires and billionaires that own them. But there are still thousands of paintings owned by us, all of us, the nation. And to find out more about paintings that you can see for free near you, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash your paintings. art historian James Fox is looking to rewrite the history of 20th century British painting in the start of a new series, British Masters, which starts tomorrow night at 9 on BBC Four.